Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, MILE. Great, thank you so much, Ali. And hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and I look forward to uh, sharing some insights around innovation and how innovation can be optimized in your organizations and in your worlds, and uh, then hopefully have a very lively discussion uh, where we we bring out some of the experiences you're having, share some of your concerns, maybe some of your success stories. So without further ado, uh, let's jump in. So the real the focus here is going to be around fixing innovation or optimizing innovation in your organization. And I thought this was a uh, interesting image to bring to bear. You know, the brain kind of on fire with ideas and energy, uh, with possibility and uh, with the ability to really uh, drive your organizations forward. Obviously, we all know that uh, within the organizations that we, uh, that we reside in, there's constraints that keep all that, all that creativity, all that greatness from always coming out. We want to talk today about how we can optimize those. And really, you know, what's the point? So I thought this, this quote at the bottom of the, the page really summed that up. To, those who innovate are at an advantage over all others. And you know the world is constantly uh, moving forward, as we all know. Innovation is something that is essential uh, in our lives, in our organizations, to move forward. So, how do we optimize that process? And I was just, you know, what we've seen a lot of is, unfortunately, uh, innovation is treated as uh, something that's uh, very idea-based and very, uh, un, you know, non-process-driven, and it's something that we feel that if you put a, a stronger process around. Uh, while allowing for that creativity and harvesting that creativity and energy, you can really uh, get great outcomes. So a little bit about the journey we'll be taking together. Uh, we, we've, I've already been introduced, but you'll see another picture of me just for your reference, a little background for your reference. We'll, talk, we'll define what innovation is and what it isn't. What are the different types? Uh, we'll talk about our goals for today. Uh, how to make innovation work will be a, a central tenet of what we discuss and go over. We'll go through a case uh, that'll show you some of the work that we've done and how we've made innovation stick. And then we'll get into that question and discussion portion. And at the end of the slides, we have for your reference some more information about our organization, the Columbia Leadership Group, and how to contact us in the future. So just a little a little background on who you're speaking to, not just who I am, but where I come from. Uh, you know, we're we're a a uh, consulting firm that's focused on bringing the best uh, research and methodologies uh, from top business schools. We work with a lot of top business schools around the world, actually doing a lot of their work behind the scenes, but also bringing flexibility and client orientation. So when we engage with our clients, we're very hands-on as the managing partner and our other partners of the firm are very hands-on in the experience that we have with our, with our clients. Uh, so we really bring the best of both worlds to the work and we bring the best of, our, of both worlds to this innovation work. So let's talk about our goals today. So we'll talk about what innovation is, what its various forms are, uh, how it works and sometimes doesn't work, and also how do we apply innovation for success. So getting into what I was speaking about earlier, which is what's the process here? What's the process for optimizing innovation? And sometimes that seems counterintuitive. Innovation, like I said, is so, feels so free-flowing and someone in their garage tinkering away on the next big thing, but if you optimize it through processes, uh, supportive processes, processes that really help uh, individuals unleash that power within, within organizations, uh, you get great results. So just a little bit about us. We're based in New York. Uh, we have offices in, in Miami and Frankfurt, Germany as well. And as you can see by the third paragraph, we've worked with great companies all over the world. Uh, we really enjoy our work. Uh, we enjoy putting the client first, and we enjoy helping them achieve uh, successes that maybe they were only dreaming about or were only frustrated about before we uh, interacted with them. And we work a lot in, in situations where there's a need for a lot of growth and there's a lot of change and uncertainty occurring. We've talked about me already. We can fast forward through that. So let's talk about what innovation is. So, at its core, it's about taking, 
taking invention and moving it forward, right? So it's about a process of implementing new ideas and creating value in your organization. What we often see in our work in innovation and in our research and meta-research around innovation is that uh, the idea phase is relatively easy. Everyone has a great idea. Taking it from ideation through the process to actually creating value for the organization, the organization's stakeholders, uh, primarily its, its clients or customers, is the difficult part. Uh, innovation can also be creating a new service system or process or enhancing existing ones. So innovation is occurring all around us all the time. Uh, we need to support it as we talked about. And as I've already talked about, it's about creativity. Uh, it's about bringing ideas to life as the, the GE saying uh, goes. Uh, it's also linked to performance and growth. Uh, so it's, it doesn't run counter to efficiency or productivity or quality. Uh, or competitive positioning or market share. So those, those stalwarts, those um, foundational principles of effective business, of successful business, are not uh, you know, against or paradoxical to innovation. The, the two work together. Innovation increases these things, makes them better. And I think that's an important distinction to remember that often uh, in, in a lot of our work with organizations and leaders, people like to think black or white. They like to think either or. I think it's very important to take on the concept as a leader of, of and. So innovation and efficiency working together, that the, the two things actually complement each other versus or. So let's set the table. So what are the trends affecting innovation? The innovation does not occur in a vacuum, uh, obviously. So you have increased global competition. I'm sure you're experiencing this on a daily basis, things like free trade, you know, your competitors could be anyone from anywhere. Uh, you have things like advances in technology, obviously, which is happening all the time. Uh, new types of products and services. You have uh, small disruptive forces and players coming into things uh, and resources required for more than one organization. So there's the ability to need to partner now as well. There's increased volatility of resources. So uh, raw materials, uh, are commoditized at an ever greater pace and you really need to work on exposure uh, look at your exposure and minimize your risks you're changing in diverse market needs so your you're most likely organizations are involved in multiple markets or are seeking to be involved in multiple markets and those multiple markets have different needs and, and obviously those are affected by things like demographics and culture and society and the way business is done the way consumers interact with the marketplace and with your products or services. And then, you know, to top it off, you have in increased environmental concerns. So we have to do this all in a way that is now in an ever uh, increasing manner, protecting the planet, protecting the environment, uh, making things sustainable. So that is an extra layer of complexity that we're bringing to the innovation work that we do. And I'm sure the work that you do on a daily basis and other, other, uh, areas of your business. And then there's obviously industry specific trends that are happening. They could be specific trends around deregulation or regulation. Uh, they could be currency uh, situations or uh, movements. They could be uh, geopolitical risks that are specific to a certain industry. Maybe an industry is singled out in a certain country for, uh, for extra scrutiny, for instance. So those are also uh, trends affecting innovation. So the, the key here is that innovation, as I said, is not occurring in a vacuum. Uh, it's something that's uh, with you all the time and it's being affected by market forces all the time. So why do it again, right? So back to the first slide, you know, you get an advantage through being innovative. Uh, I was doing some research recently and found out that only 9% of U.S. companies are engaged in any form of active innovation, which is quite interesting, quite troubling. More, I would say, must, must need to be involved in innovation in a much bigger way. And I think executives uh, here agree with me, 93% of executives believe innovation-driven growth will be a major driver for revenue growth. Uh, but if you look at the white uh, percentage, 37% don't have a clear innovation strategy. So we have a gap here, we have a gap from from thinking to doing, a gap uh, that needs to be crossed in order to get the green 
uh, excuse me, green, <laughs> the yellow uh, percentage, which is greater than 40% growth for companies that innovate uh, the best. They grow the fastest. So the, the, the most innovative companies are growing 40% faster than non-innovative companies. And so what are the strategies of leading innovators? What are they doing? If we take a look at them, we peel back, uh, peel back the onion and look inside, what's happening? So they're innovating with purpose. So they have a clear uh, reason for innovating. You know, it, it's, it's central to who we are in our organization. It's to bring, in the, in the healthcare industry, to bring uh, life-saving solutions to our patients. Uh, in technology, it's to make people's lives easier or more connected. So there is a purpose. It is linked to the purpose of the organization and also to individual purpose. They have a well-defined innovation strategy. So they don't just leave it at purpose. They drive it down into their innovation strategy. That innovation strategy is linked uh, very closely to their business strategy. Third, uh, there's a formal and structured approach to innovation, which we'll talk about the way we go about it. But innovation is not just about ideation. It's not just about coming up with ideas, putting them in the suggestion box, and hoping for the best. And it's not just something that is done in R&D, uh, research and development. They focus on a bigger portion of radical innovation. So we'll talk about radical innovation versus incremental innovation, short wave innovation versus long wave innovation as well. And this radical game changing innovation is where they're focusing uh, an outsized portion of their innovation efforts. Uh, there's a broad range of business model innovation, so they're not just innovating when they go to new markets, they're also innovating in their uh, home or established markets, for instance. And there's a wider range of innovation operating models. So one size does not fit all. Um, they're making innovation work differently in different parts of their organization. And they're open to collaboration with external partners. So obviously this is big in terms of joint ventures in the healthcare space, for instance. It's big in terms of outsourcing trials, uh, joint drug development, uh, for instance. And obviously there's, there's many examples in the technological space as well. So this slide is answering the why. So let's get into types of innovation. So the first is product innovation. I think that's the one that we're all most uh, aware of. It's probably the, the default or the prototypical uh, I, idea we have when we think about innovation in our minds, the picture that we paint in our minds of the iPhone, you know, of course. So it consists of changes to product attributes with a change in how the product is noticed by consumers. So making a better mousetrap is product innovation. But we have three other innovations that really don't seem to get the same uh, space in our brains or in, in the popular consciousness, the, the, the first of those being process innovation. So we're talking about changes in a product or service, how things are produced. Uh, it might not imp impact the final product, but there are benefits to the process. You increase productivity and reducing costs. So that's that one that feels counterintuitive to innovation. But as I said earlier, um, this is where it really harmonizes and works well together. And incremental innovation, we're talking about small continuous improvements to products and services, uh, product lines. So slight changes that keep making things better. Uh, and, then we're and then we alluded to radical innovation earlier, so representing a change in the way that the product or service is consumed, game changing. Um, it's a new paradigm to the market segment and modifies the existing business model. So here we're talking about actually changing the game, creating new markets, creating new models. And we can talk more about that as we go. Um, so challenges to innovation. So it, it, I hope I've established the, the baseline and the, the argument that innovation is worth doing. Executives want it. They're having a problem doing it. So why are they having a problem doing it? So let's look at some more numbers on the challenges to innovation. So 54%. Uh, you know, taking innovative ideas to market quickly in a scalable way. So that's a challenge that people are seeing. There's more than half of uh, folks that were interviewed, executives that were interviewed, uh, were saying that, hey, it's challenging making this happen quickly in a scalable way. It's easy to come up with the idea. 
finding and retaining the best talent to make innovation happen? How do you build uh, capacity and capabilities in your existing people or bringing on innovation ready people? Also, more than half of respondents. Uh, establishing a culture of innovation, almost half of respondents were saying that is a challenge. And it's pr I would assume it's probably not more because uh, many executives are probably even flabbergasted or put off by the idea of even uh, coming in. What is an innovation culture? How do we even tackle that? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's quite a big thing to work on. Finding the right external partners who we're going to work with. Can we work with our competitors, for instance? Is that possible? That's a challenge. Um, and then we get into metrics. You know, what is measured is done. What is rewarded is done well, the old saying goes. Uh, what are the metrics we use to measure innovation and return on investment? And what the results showed as well, which isn't shown in these numbers, is that almost every company was finding uh, big challenges in the innovation process, that there weren't uh, clear companies that had these all mastered. Everyone was popping up on at least one of these areas. So there's, there's intense challenges to innovation. And, I think it goes back to that either or thinking that innovation is something that lies in R&D and efficiency and customer service and driving growth is something that lies outside of outside of R&D. It's something that lies in the, the core business. Let's take a moment and look at this continuous innovation loop. This is the, the, the on a very basic level, the process of, of innovation. If we start at the top, we take on a scientific lens. The mindset of being a scientist, I think, is something that's uh, underutilized in organizations. And I'd encourage you to take on the mindset uh, of uh, being a scientist in your organization. So if we take that mindset, we start with assessing. We don't run with our assumptions or our past experiences. We try to keep them from influencing us or over influencing us and we and we try to clear our mind so we start with assessment we look at innovation management capabilities is innovation being managed in this organization does somebody just come up with an idea and run with it and seek their own funding and their own support is that how things are done here is innovation done at all here are our ideas uh, at such a premium that uh, when they do come up uh, they uh, you know, they're supported in such a way that makes them uh, happen, makes them happen quickly, makes them happen uh, in an efficient way. Or, you know, if people stop coming up with ideas because it's not supported in the organization. So is there, is there a current the future state analysis happening? So we look at uh, what's happening, uh, you know, now in terms of innovation and where you want to get to. So back to that gap between what executives are saying, you know, the 93% and then uh, at that much lower percentage of what's actually getting done in terms of innovation. We look at capability gaps, so back to people. People innovate, and I think, you know, uh, I don't want to make it too strongly process focused. People are driving processes, and people, as we get into the next box, are very important for the innovation process, and the most important part of the innovation process. So we look at capabilities. And then innovation management and maturity mapping. So, uh, you know, how is innovation being managed uh, moving forward, what's that process look like, and what's the, how do we get to a, a mature state, or how mature, in essence, benchmarked is this organization versus others in innovation? So then we need to go in based on those on those finding those recommendations. We need to get buy-in. We need to get sponsors and champions. We need to get facilitators and trainers to bring the development up of people. And we do a lot of work in that area as well. Uh, we need to review and select. Uh, board practitioners. So who, who's going to run this innovation process? <coughs> Excuse me. Then we get into the strategic piece. So we go big, then we go uh, small, and then we embed over the next three uh, squares here. So training and education, you know, what are we teaching people? How are we changing our culture through education and through learning, starting with leaders and moving down into the organization? What are we doing? What are the messages we're sending in terms of cultural change? How are we communicating that? Uh, what's happening with our rewards and recognition? Back to the piece of 
what gets measured gets done and what gets rewarded gets done well. So too often innovation is not part of our reward system. It's not part of our recognition system. And people do it and if, if nothing else they get a thank you. Sometimes they're punished for thinking outside the box for doing things differently obviously. And this is, uh, is the wrong message you, you need to send in your organizations. So then we get into tactical processes, so problem identification, uh, ideas, uh, idea campaign strategies. So how do you get ideas? How are you going to filter ideas? And I think an important piece to notice to note here is that many organizations feel that a great first step or, or a great total step uh, is to bring out that idea box and get people to ideate and come up with new ideas about how to improve the organization in all different ways. Uh, I was talking with one of our clients recently and uh, together we uncovered a problem. You know, this seems like a very benign thing to do to get ideas from everyone in the organization and then make changes. Uh, the problem was that you're usually inundated with ideas. Uh, you can't implement all the ideas and so you then have a selection process, you know, idea filtering and selection. And now the people whose ideas have not been selected are put off to the innovation process. They're much less likely to engage in the future uh, in innovation and not to support the innovation that quote unquote won the, the bake off as we like to say uh, of, of ideation. So you know that's an issue that you need to look at as well. You know that even a simple solution uh, has these uh, interesting uh, unintended consequences especially with your people. And then also looking at project and portfolio management. So how are we managing uh, these great ideas, these great innovative uh, process improvements for instance or product improvements that we're undertaking. And then get into operationalizing it. So how do we make this happen? What's the implementation roadmap? Uh, what are the, what's our, our risk assessment analysis? Let's look at data again around processes and metrics. Uh, what's the what's the cost benefit analysis? What's the cash curve analysis? Where do where do we start making money? Where do we start saving money through implementing uh, these uh, great ideas? So obviously, there's a lot that can that can uh, be challenging about this process, uh, especially when it's set within an organization that's been very successful and has at doing what it does for a long time and has not been innovating for a long time. So to, to tackle it in a, in a, a simple equation, uh, the way we prefer to tackle uh, innovation challenges in organizations, first looking at an innovation audit, adding that up with the second piece which is how to lead for innovation, how to get the, the key stakeholders on board within the organization, typically the leadership, uh, adding that to embedding the innovation. We found means maximizing innovation and financial performance. So we'll go through what that looks like on a high level now. So the first step is the innovation audit. Uh, the challenge here is to uncover the most critical and effective levers to improve innovation and determine the best practices for improving innovation. Once again, going in with that science, that scientific, that scientist mindset and seeing what you're, you know, what's observable, you know, are, uh, are people, how many, you know, how many innovations are coming out of R and D? How many innovations are coming out of production? How many innovations are coming out of customer service? Uh, is, is all innovation sitting in R&D, for instance? Is there hidden innovation and ways of innovating well that are happening in customer service, for instance? We need to, we need to find those pieces. So what's the approach? So examine research-based determinants of innovation. So taking on that scientific lens. So what's happening with leadership? Does leadership talk about innovation? How often? What are their messages around it? Do they act on innovation? You know, are, is their talk equaling their action? Is it out of proportion? What are the results of what they're saying? What are the dynamic capabilities of the organization? Is the organization able to move, to change, to innovate? Does it have the capabilities to do that? Does it have enablers? You know, does it have ways uh, of making it happen or does it have 
pieces that are keeping it from happening? And does it have innovation and growth processes? You know, do these already exist? And if they exist, to what, to what degree and how, how functional are they? Also looking at quantitative surveys um, and qualitative interviews. So the quantitative, you know, what are people thinking? What are the metrics showing? <coughs> Excuse me. And the qualitative where you really get that richness uh, of learning through storytelling, of understanding what's happening, uh, you know, in the quote-unquote weeds of the organization and how innovation is treated in the unofficial way, in the social networking way. Both, you know, we have lots of examples of organizations and CEOs saying, we won't need to innovate. We're 100% behind innovation. And you go down and have interviews with, uh, you know, shop floor managers at the factory, and what do they say? There's, there's no room for innovation here. I made a suggestion last week around improving the production process. I was told politely to sit down and get back to my work. So obviously you need to uncover these uh, inconsistencies. This is also done by shadowing, so looking at what's happening, following people around, following executives around, uh, following uh, around on the production floor, going on client calls, and also raw metrics. So unfiltered metrics of the business output, uh, things like of that nature, efficiency statistics. So what's the impact of all this? So you create urgency and build momentum for change. I think the, the, a great benefit of doing an approach that really involves shadowing and qualitative interviews and surveys are you're building awareness that something is being done around innovation. And more importantly, that my voice as that shop floor uh, manager is being heard around innovation. It's setting up uh, a participatory process that's going to help you in your change process around innovation. Like I talked about, you're discovering blind spots and biases and also neglected levers for innovation. Um, and out of that, you get a, an innovation roadmap. So these are the gaps. This is where we should go. Um, this is how we're going to move things forward. So that's the first stage of the equation, the first uh, variable in the equation, the innovation audit. The second piece, leading for innovation. So like I said earlier, innovation is about people. People are going to drive your innovation. They're going to sustain your innovation. They're going to create the mindset. They're going to create the culture. And they're going to make it happen. I think all too often, <coughs> excuse me, we feel that innovation or any business process is driven by a, uh, a decree from a leader, maybe a CEO, and then it just happens. And, and people do it because they're supposed to do it. And that's what they're paid to do, is to take orders. Um, as, we, as you've probably experienced in your life, uh, people need to be motivated around things. They need to see the point. They need to see the impact. They need to feel good about it, at least on a long-term basis. So you need to build the capability to lead for innovation make innovation happen in people. So the challenge here is to design and develop and deliver uh, a multi-month innovation program across global leadership populations. <coughs> Excuse me. And the idea here is that if we can get a critical mass, get the tipping point of leaders on board with innovating, then innovating will now cascade down into the organization and it will become not just the function of R&D, or the function of pockets of the organization, but it'll be something that is lived within the organization. So the approach is to develop comprehensive program, blueprint, uh, content and learning process and toolkits, and to go on a journey with leaders around innovation. So we're very big on getting out of theory, getting out of conversation and getting into action. So just in time, working on innovation projects that, that need to drive growth or drive efficiency in the organization and using that as a way to support leaders in their change, their changing mindsets around innovation and their changing actions around innovation. So you're talking about innovation projects, shadowing, pairing individuals up through Venn pairing with uh, 
other leaders who maybe have a different take on innovation and also coaching them through their challenges and through their roadblocks around their thinking around innovation. So if you can unlock the top group of leaders in your organization, the C-suite, C minus one, C minus two, sometimes C minus three, you're going to have this great impact. You're going to be able to align leadership with the vision around innovation and build guiding coalitions across the organization, breaking down silos because they're working on innovation together. You're building their competencies around innovation. You're accelerating speed and momentum. You're not just saying go do it and you're not providing them with support. Uh, you're initiating culture shaping because you're making it happen and they're, they're creating the culture. It's not uh, some consultants like me creating the culture. It's not the top C-suite creating the culture. It's the organization is creating this culture. You're accelerating your financial performance by getting these projects done and getting them done well around innovation. And you're developing new archetypical <coughs> or archetype business models, that new ways of doing business through innovative processes. Excuse me. So that's that's the second piece leading for innovation. The third the third component of the equation, embedding innovation, is where you build it in, you build it in, and it's something that really sticks the organization and gets into the DNA of the organization. So the challenge here is about designing and delivering and advising holistic and integral embedding of initiatives across the organization. So innovation has to go beyond just being projects that leaders are doing to something that the organization is living. And how do you do that? I think you do that through systems. Um, we've seen you do that through this approach, which is building capabilities. You advise on the strategy. Uh, you build the structures and systems. You allocate resources. You, know, you look at how the organization is going to learn and share knowledge over time. And you continually monitor and improve the corporate culture. And you build these capabilities and advise on a full spectrum of innovation and growth processes. So it, it, you get into a lot of advisement, a lot of moving different levers, a lot of uh, rewards and recognition around innovation, keeping innovation front of mind, and blending innovation in to the daily work. The innovation is not just the flavor of the month. It is not just something that we're changing or modifying uh, because it's what we need to do now. It's what we need to do into the future. You think about organizations like Procter & Gamble, they need to innovate uh, billions of new growth, billions of U.S. dollars in new growth every year just to sustain their market valuation. And how do they do that? They've embedded innovation within their organization. So there's a, the impact here is you, the whole organization is aligned behind the innovation transformation. You've, you're building these capabilities. Uh, around processes, around innovation, uh, and they're, they're dynamic so they can change. You're building the ability for the organization to change, and this is spearheaded through the ability of leaders to change. You're sustaining and deepening embedded innovation transformation. Uh, you're continuing to improve those business models, and you're sustaining acceleration of financial performance. <laughs> so that's the third component, embedding innovation. So let's jump into a case and make it come to life for you. I know that was a lot. I mean, that's a long process. That's a multi-year process. And even after we leave the stage, it's something that, that has to be maintained and improved over time. You cannot uh, ever stop keeping watch uh, over innovation in your organization. So I think it is not a one-time event. It is not a workshop. It is not a project. It is not R&D. It is an ongoing piece of your organization. So a case example, we'll talk about the innovation audit pieces, which is that first piece of the equation. It, it could take some time to go through all those pieces, so I thought, let's start in the beginning. Our challenge was that our organization, the Columbia Leadership Group, was engaged by a new uh, regional CEO of a global health core, or healthcare organization, excuse me, um, to go in and take a comprehensive look and a research-based look at what was happening in terms of innovation and to develop that roadmap moving forward. Uh, all within the context of what's happening in the market. So as a market where there's a lot of change, there's a lot of regulatory pressure, 
but there also were some adjacent new markets uh, that the CEO really wanted to get into in a big way. So a lot of the focus of the business was on that. The focus was not on innovation uh, when we started. So what did we do? We came in, we, we, we did the innovation audit. So we did those pieces we're talking about, the surveys, the interviews, the shadowing, looking at the raw data. And this starts at the top. I think many uh, undertakings for change in, in any capacity often fail or give a free pass to the C-suite. Now there's such reverence to the C-suite, to the top team, to the board, um, that often they're not put under the microscope. And we do put them under the microscope, and that's what we did here. So we looked at the CEO, what was he saying versus what was he doing? And to go deeper, could he handle ambiguity? Could he handle uncertainty? Did he have an unconventional bone in his body? Because innovation is about doing things unconventionally. Was he more authoritative? Was he more proactive? Uh, what was his personal initiative? And what we found was that he had a tolerance for ambiguity that was uh, a bit hidden. Uh, he was good with being unconventional as long as it resulted in positive uh, financial performance over time. He did have an author authoritarian way about him. He was proactive <clears throat> and he had personal initiative around this which is very important and that we we measured that that initiative was not going to wane uh, over time uh, part of it was that he brought us in to do this work uh, also in, in interviewing his top team uh, that was something that they mentioned that he was behind innovation and he had been talking about it and, and doing things about it in other roles in the organization so it was a platform that he was bringing up to the c-suite and to the ceo position we looked at the top team uh, their education, their age, their tenure diversity, uh, you know, or were they open to it? Were they collaborating well? Did we have to do some team uh, development to get them to a place? We found that there was a lot of infighting here between country heads. There was a lot of, uh, you know, squabbling over what we found to be relatively unimportant um, resource allocations. So we needed to work with that team and then the next stage we actually worked with the team to make them a better team so they can make this happen. And then looking at the board, you know, what's the div div diversity? Uh, we found that there was a lot of obviously uh, healthcare and ex-healthcare players on the board, uh, which contributed to myopic thinking and f thinking focused just on healthcare and thinking that was not cross-pollinated by innovation in other uh, industries. And you know what's institutional shareholding, and also uh, how are how are people uh, incentivized? We also did a capabilities audit or a dynamic capabilities audit at DCA. We looked at the strategy, mission, and goals. <coughs> so, was strategy? Uh, part of innovation and vice versa. We found that innovation was not baked into the strategy enough, that it was alluded to, you know, words like we want to be more innovative, we want to be faster to market through innovation, we're in the strategy, but there weren't specific goals around it. It was, it was kind of left hanging. So one of the areas we worked on moving forward was improving that and making it much more specific, and especially around um, innovation, around market growth into these new adjacent markets. Around structure and system, you know, is there a fit between the organizational design and the types of innovation? We found there was not, that the organization was not designed for innovation outside of product innovation in R&D, for instance. Uh, same with resource allocation. Uh, R&D was getting almost all the innovation resources, obviously. Um, and if we talk about turnover of resources, turnover of people, uh, that was not an issue. Uh, they, were, they were resource heavy uh, in both in both people and uh, funding. In terms of organizational learning and knowledge management or KM, what was the level of support for experimentation? I think the support was high, uh, but the message wasn't getting down and it wasn't supported through the corporate culture. Uh, there was a tolerance for failed ideas. There was not. There was a mindset of uh, zero tolerance. I mean, you're talking about a healthcare company where mistakes kill people. 
Um, so there was not a tolerance for failed ideas, which was one of the larger um, issues that we had to overcome uh, in terms of implementation of change. And uh, formal, former, excuse me, formal idea generation tools weren't existing, so they weren't used, obviously. In terms of corporate culture, it was more hier hierarchical, which is, is typically bad for innovation. Uh, people didn't feel that they could speak up, that they could share their perspectives easily and share their ideas. Uh, we talked about risk already. Uh, and per but there was a personal motivation. People, yeah, it's, an, it's innate in people um, to want to innovate, to want to move things forward. So that we also found that. And then we looked at the processes themselves, uh, or the lack thereof. Um, but we looked at them in an informal way. So uh, how did you initiate and make decisions? Um, <coughs> excuse me. This was done on a, a very haphazard way, uh, a very ad hoc manner that ideas were brought up on the shop, on the production floor, for instance, or, or uh, in terms of working with uh, providers or stakeholders and run up the ladder, or sometimes implemented, sometimes not never systemically supported outside of R&D. Talked about R&D portfolio. Um, there were really not optimization tools in place. Uh, you're talking about innovation generation or adoption, uh, trials and, pro and production. Uh, so the development and implementation outside of R&D again was non-existent. I mean there were some things you could learn from R&D and, and move into the rest of the organization. And then in terms of project management, they were very good at managing projects, but they don't, didn't have innovation projects in any kind of big way. They had projects that had innovation pieces to them. Um, and so there, there, was, there was money that could be reallocated and was later reallocated for commercialization for market testing, but that wasn't the way the organization went into new markets or, or went in with new offerings to markets. They usually just jumped in with big launches. And they were getting to a place where they're having a number of big product launches. Uh, they were having adherence to scheduling in most cases, uh, but that was crowding out the bandwidth for innovation. And that was something we brought up to the executives and the CEO's attention. So what were the outcomes? So out of that, we had a, came up with an innovation audit report, which uh, obviously shared our findings. Uh, enhancements to leadership process capabilities uh, in the organization, so recommendations about that, uncovering of strengths and weaknesses, looking at opportunities and threats as well around in innovation. Uh, coming up with this, this roadmap that really it tackled the 10 to 15 most urgent improvement areas, but also supplemented that with easy, you know, a handful of easily achievable improvement opportunities to build positive momentum for uh, making the organization uh, more focused on innovation. An executive summary and briefing for leadership is, is something that we conducted. And then a one to two day innovation session, or actually in this case a bunch of innovation sessions with various levels of leadership to foster buy and kickstart adoption of the process. Some examples of the recommendations that came out of this, uh, creating, a, in, creating an innovation directive with a small team of leaders to support the strategy of innovation. Uh, started to shift work, so g give some people the ability to uh, innovate more as a larger portion of their job, as a, as a finite focused portion of their job, and also job shadowing so they could see how innovation was happening, learn from others who are innovating well in the organization, uh, setting up the governance around innovation, how do we, for instance, kill ideas. Uh, many organizations are bad at killing ideas. Uh, they're very good at, at coming up with ideas. Bringing innovation together with the strategy uh, across the organization was something that uh, we recommended and end up doing in, in further stages of the, of the uh, work. Building cross-functional teams to, to make those projects happen that would happen in the future. Um, talking about span of control and establishing that. So, you know, what could an employee do around uh, if they discovered an issue on the, in the production facility, for instance? And they could not just how to improve it now, but how to improve it uh, in the long run, and what was the process for that, and how are they re rewarded, for instance, and recognized for that, which was a big recommendation we had, and, and a lever that we feel is underutilized and was underutilized in this case. And then, what are, what are the systems we need to build to, to foster a free flow of ideas and knowledge? 
So obviously lots to do here. It's a very meaty uh, engagement. <clears throat> you know, taking on innovation is not to be done lightly. And we find that many executives uh, talk the talk because it's what they should be saying, but they don't necessarily walk the walk around it. So now let's jump into discussion. A couple, obviously, you'll take your questions. We have a nice discussion, but a couple things to think about, uh, either for our discussion now or, or for your own reflections. You know, what do you find exciting about innovation? On the counter side, a counterpoint, what do you find worrisome? Um, how can innovation increase performance in your organization and or reduce costs? Remember, we talked about that it's not an either or equation. And then obviously, what are your questions? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Folks, we are open for the question and answers. If you have any questions, you could put it in the question box or you could raise your hand. There is a hand icon available on your console. If you click on it, uh, you will be able to speak. Online also. So but let me go straight to the question box. We have a couple of questions already posted, so I'll be the first one. Mr. Michael, do we have any stats about the types of innovation which illustrates which method of innovation is the most effective in sustaining competitive edge? Is it product, process, incremental, or radical innovation? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the stats show that if you're, uh, and, and uh, please excuse me, I don't have them on the top of my mind, but that if you're innovating in the radical sense, if you're innovating the long wave of innovation, so as an organization you have the systems and processes and most importantly the mindset around innovation, that's where you're getting the effective product innovations. So obviously I don't want to overplay Google or Apple, but they're, they're the, they are the, the Hello, uh, Michael. Is Michael, you there? We lost your audio now. Higher revenue in terms of and profit in terms of product innovation. There's other organizations that are very focused just on product innovation, and what you find is that um, they're sometimes good at uh, making a better cell phone, for instance, but they're not necessarily good at building the next cell phone or the cell phone replacement. And this is an issue in many emerging markets. I was just listening to a talk yesterday talking about China and talking about two um, automakers and how one was very deliberate in building a culture of innovation over time and one uh, just copied uh, innovations of others and then was very good at incremental innovation. And the organization that built uh, the the culture of innovation over time was was much more successful. Um, obviously, that's just a, a, a comparison of two organizations, but that's what we find in our research and in the meta research that is out there. That building the culture, investing in the culture of innovation, uh, is the way to go in the long run, and that will give you the the outcomes that you're looking for in terms of uh, product innovation. Two, three more questions. But in the meantime, uh, one of the attendees requests is, sir, could you please put the slide of the innovation process again? Uh, yes, bear with me, please. Okay. And uh, let me... I assume it's this slide in the loop, or... Yeah, yes. so, yeah that is the one, I guess. So this is the innovation process. Mr. Osama John was asking for. So, Mr. Osama, if you are satisfied with the slide that is being illustrated now, please let us know. Uh, let me move to the other question. What initial steps do you recommend foreign organizations to take for establishing an innovation culture? I really think that shining light on the issue or the opportunity is, a first, is the first step. The first step is to have the conversation around innovation, to say we want to innovate and just like I did in this presentation, to make the business case for innovation. That the, the, the fact of the matter is that it, it is beneficial for us to innovate and not just to take it at, uh, 
face value that we need to innovate, but these are the reasons that will have better return, that will have more vo motivated and engaged people. Um, you know, not just that everyone's doing it, so we need to innovate. Because th as you saw through this presentation and through the case example, it is a uh, complex, challenging, multi-year process. So you need to really make sure in the beginning that the organization and the individuals within the organization are on board around innovation. And they're not just doing it because everyone else is doing it. Because what we found in those cases is that organizations cannot sustain the change that they lose interest, they lose motivation, they lose energy around the innovation. And they're, they're just doing it because someone else is doing it. So start having the conversation and, and then the next step is around really looking at some sort of audit, some sort of way of getting opinions from people. And working in the organization. There's most likely in your organization very good things that are happening around innovation in pockets of the organization. There's places where no innovation is happening. There might be places where very negative or poor things are happening around innovation. Uh, but in having the conversation, not only are you going to uncover those pieces, uh, but you're also going to engage people in the process. But this is not a top-down process. Uh, this is a process that really involves everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have another interesting one. In this age of information, do you suggest that one should become proactive and loudly announce or share its upcoming innovative products well in advance, or rather keep it secret and move discreetly? That's a great question. I'm trying to, I want to base my answer in, uh, in, in research and experience. Uh, I think, once again, we're getting into the product innovation piece, which is the outcome of the of these processes, which I think is very important. I think obviously, you know, my favorite answer is it depends, but I'll try to be a little more specific than that. I think taking, taking into account a lot of market conditions is important. Obviously, building up a buzz around your products uh, is very positive. I would say that releasing uh, hints, teasers about your product uh, is something that's very uh, encouraging from a marketing standpoint. It's something that uh, keeps people very interested, keeps your stakeholders, your clients, your customers uh, very interested in what's happening. Releasing it uh, very early in a situation where they cannot handle it or they cannot have it, they cannot feel it, if, let's say it's, you know, using the smartphone idea again, uh, it is, is something that's not effective. That People, people are in the, very much in the I want it now culture, uh, but they do like to be teased a little bit. So I don't know if, if people have seen the, uh, these little trailers about the new Star Wars movie, for instance, but they're very short. Um, they're very cryptic. Uh, they, you don't know what's happening, uh, but they're very interesting and they get people's, people's attention and they get a lot, there's been a lot of talk about them, for instance. Uh, but they're not revealing anything uh, game changing about the actual product, in this case of film. And I think that's, that's the way to go in most cases, uh, depending on what the market conditions are and what, uh, what the condition, what kind of product you have, for instance. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have one last question. In your observation, what is the major hindrance within organizations to not to spend in R&D or innovation? Is it finance or merely lack of priority? I think it's it's the conceptualization of innovation. I think it's how people understand innovation. And the default understanding of innovation is that it is product innovation. And because most people and most leaders think it is product innovation, they say we will just focus on R&D. And they make the mistake of not understanding the larger picture of innovation that we talked about today. Uh, and they make the mistake of not acting on that and turning ed everyone into a possible innovator in the organization or giving them the opportunity to do so. And that, that is the biggest hindrance. Uh, obviously the journey, as we talked about, can be complex. Uh, you know, we feel that you need someone to guide you through that journey. That's typically the role that we play, the, the role of Sherpa through the journey uh, of innovation, uh, change and capability building. But, but as, you, as you can also see, those, that's a very step uh, you know, a step-specific process. It's very straightforward in the way that 
it, it moves. You know, if we look at the continuous innovation loop, it's, it makes sense. It moves forward. Uh, the issue is that piece around grasping innovation as a larger uh, concept, as an and concept, you know, that it is about uh, making things better and ideating, but it's also about uh, operations and it's about efficiency, it, that it, it encompasses everything. And if you can grasp that concept, if you can win over uh, a critical mass of especially leaders in your organization around that concept, then you can go on the innovation journey and be successful. Okay, well, thank you very much. That really brings us towards the end of the webinar, Mr. Holland. Any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? It was a pleasure to speak with you today. I hope this was of value. And uh, if you uh, would like to have further conversations. I'm always open to having conversations. So you'd like to talk more specifically about what's happening in your organization or maybe you have some uh, questions that you didn't feel comfortable asking now or questions that will pop in your mind over the next few days. Uh, my contact information uh, is here on the on the slide deck. I'm happy to have uh, my assistant set up some time for us to speak and happy to be a resource for you now and in the future. Well, thank you very much and I really want to thank you on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership for your valuable time and for conducting this live webinar with us. Thank you very much, sir, and thank you all of those who participated in this webinar and for your time and for your for your questions. We are recording this webinar, which will be uploaded on webinar.mile.org. Please stay tuned to this link for our upcoming webinars and also to access the recorded questions. With that note, I would like to end it. So you all have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're from. So we'll Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, MILE.